Hi, everybody. I'm Miley from Hashtag Open. Welcome to Hashtag Open Ed. In a moment, Sarah is going to introduce Blackson, who's here to tell you all about impact play. But first, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Hashtag Open. Hashtag Open is a dating community for sex-positive open relationships, BDSM, polyamory. Um, for people maybe who are looking for dating that's a little bit um, not traditional. So when you join Hashtag Open, you'll find a community of open-minded members. Right now we have 97% of our members that identify as or being interested in exploring consensual non-monogamy. We also have a lot of members who are identifying as queer, trans, non-binary, as well as people who are interested in exploring their sexuality more, or maybe even their kinks. Um, you can identify yourself by choosing labels from our extensive list of options, or you can add in your own if you don't see something that works for you. If you're somebody who's looking to explore with your significant other, with your partners, we have partner accounts. That means you can swipe, match, and chat with other members in app, either together with your partner or on your own. We also have hashtags that will allow you to match with other users and members based on your interests. You can list your preferences, interests, and boundaries right on your profile. And the hashtags are also going to make it easy to, for other users to find you based on those shared interests if you just try one of our hashtag searches in app. Right now, we are 60,000 members strong and continuing, continuing to grow. If you haven't checked out the app, download us for iOS or Android. Membership is free and available at hashtagopen.com. We hope to see you in app and swiping so that you can find maybe some fun partners to do fun things like impact play. We would love for you to go search that in app. And Sarah, please tell us more about tonight and our guest, Blackson. Oh my gosh, thank you, Miley. Um, <laughs> hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Sloan, and I am the Director of Communications and Operations here at Hashtag Open. And um, it is a not terribly big secret that part of the reason that I love doing Hashtag Open Ads is because my uh, main calling is around education around alternative sexuality and alternative relationships. And so I tend to go to a lot of events, um, or I did before the current pandemic started, and I actually met Blackson at uh, an event here in Chicago a few years ago, and Blackson, you were on a panel, I think, um, but I remembered chatting with you really briefly. I still have your card. It's in the, it's in my little business card bowl in my living room. Um, and you, you know, I was like, I, I really appreciate you. How can I, how can I find out more about you? You gave me your card. We never connected, but now we have. So, um, so I, I really wanted to, um, you know, like, I wasn't the person who actually initially suggested that we have Blackson. That was Miley who was like, I am following this person on the social medias and they are amazing. And Miley told me who, and I was like, holy shit. Yes, we must work with Blackson. So, um, so now that you, <laughs> now that we've given you the well, well-deserved, um, ego stroke, <laughs> that we love you. Um, just to tell you a little bit about Blackson. Um, Blackson is a Philly-based BDSM educator. We've been having a lot of Philly-based folks in. Philly is like apparently like the new sex positive That's capital cool of North America. Um, but in addition to teaching, um, Blackson is also a writer, a visual artist, a professional dominant, a content creator, a relationship anarchist, and a lover of rubber ducks who identifies as a queer non-binary non man and uses they, them pronouns. Um, we will be um, throwing Blackson's social media links into the chat in a little bit. Um, for those of you, be before we get going, for those of you who it's your first time with us, welcome, make yourselves comfortable. Um, you can sit back, relax, we will take care of you. If you have questions or comments, we are absolutely open to it. Um, Blackson will be answering those questions and we'll, we'll be, all, you know, we'll kind of have a free flowing conversation. You can just throw them into the chat, into the messages section. Um, and that way we'll make sure that we get to everything. Um, and so uh, without any further ado, um, Blackson is going to teach us a little bit about impact play tonight. Yeah. Hello, my friend. <laughs> hello, hello. Thank you so much for that amazing intro. Um, I appreciate it enormously. Um, it was so nice meeting you, 
uh, a few years back. I just want to thank you for, you know, individual any individuals who are here who have supported my work or you know followed me like in the past. Thank you so much. I want to first start by saying um, welcome. I sincerely hope that you are having a nice evening. I hope that you are surrounded by individuals who care about you. I hope that you are well and that you are safe. With me tonight is my submissive known as Solson. Solson will be helping me here and there uh, with a few things as we go along in this lesson. My lessons are usually long-winded, somewhere between an hour and a half to two to three hours sometimes. And we have a lot to cover, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to get as much done as I can so that you can walk away with something useful for yourself. So impact play is, I would say, it's an optional component of BDSM and general kink. Um, it's characterized by striking the body uh, with various implements, including the human body itself, you know, so the floggers and the canes and the paddles, but also an open or a closed hand. With me, I have a few common in, um, implements, like this wiper bite here, for instance. Okay. This thumper here, for instance. This cane as well. A rug beater. A very gorgeous paddle that I was able to obtain recently. My trusty floggers. Many of you might know me from my flogging. <laughs> a cane. They're usually, they're, this is a different kind of cane that isn't so stiff. This is a cat of nines here. These are also beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, this is a um, dragon tail. <laughs> Why don't they never open it? Uh, this is a dragon tail. Um, and this is rope. And I'll show you a neat trick with this a little later on. Okay? Now, why is impact play enjoyable to the untrained eye or somebody who doesn't have an interest in impact play? It can be distressing for that person or it can look um, not as attractive as some of us has come uh, to find within ourselves. Also, we might be a practitioner of impact play already and might not even know why we enjoy it. So the first thing we're going to cover and why it's enjoyable is, of course, power dynamics. Power is the uh, ability to exert change inside of a system. Dynamics is change, and this is the power to exert change in the system, okay? The system in play, in this case, is consent, all right? And with power dynamics, we give and we take away, we give consent or we don't give consent, uh, and that changes based on the situation that we find ourselves in. For instance, the mother to the child or the parent to the child, all right? That's a power dynamic in that that child must follow or adhere to the rules that their parent has set. The relationship that you have with your boss at work, this is a type of power dynamic, and that your boss is one in a higher, you know, state of employment um, than you are is to tell you what to do. And because of the power dynamics, power dynamics have a tendency to change how consent looks. Um, in this case, I know there were lots of times where my mother would ask me to do something or suggest that I do something, and I didn't want to do it, but I did it because that was my mother. Uh, and there were also some other consequences that we won't get into. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so um, with, with power dynamics, that's attractive to some people and that you might give up your autonomy or agency in a manner that is consenting, or you might receive someone's autonomy or agency. Another reason why uh, impact play is enjoyable for a lot of people is that it allows you to change the narrative of trauma. Um, some individuals were, you know, struck uh, as children or beat as children, um, and impact play, and I was one of those children, and um, impact play was a way to change that narrative and that it was not something that I consented to when I was a child here with other consenting individuals through the use of negotiation or sitting down to talk about the actions that we will perform inside of BDSM. I get to change that narrative. I get to exert consent in this manner, okay? Another reason why 
um, impact play is so enjoyable is because of the augmentation of the bodily uh, chemicals and hormones in our bodies. All right. When you when you experience BDSM, when you experience something like impact play, um, your bodily hormones and chemicals like oxytocin and adrenaline and endorphins, these all get these all get augmented in some way. And depending on how you change them, depending on how you make this cocktail of, of, of chemicals, one can reach what is called subspace or top space, uh, which is a class <laughs> unto itself. But I will uh, yeah. <laughs> very simply say that it is an altered state um, based on those heightened chemicals and hormones inside of your body that have caused you to leave homeostasis, which is your normal state of being. Okay. Uh, I do want to take a t I do want to make sure that I, you know, say something important about the way that those chemicals and hormones get altered. Sometimes we see it, you know, when stuff is really sexy and things are really hot and you feel like drunk or high or you feel mm -hmm. like you've been altered mm -hmm. um, in some manner. That's a result of those chemical uh, of those chemicals and hormones inside of your body. The thing that's important to remember, um, both no matter the position that you take up inside of BDSM, whether you be a top or a bottom or a dom or a sub or an active or receiver or a giver, so on and so forth, what's important to remember is that the manipulation of those bodily chemicals and hormones can um, augment your inhibitions, can change what you consent mm -hmm. to, yeah. can lower your inhibitions, can, and I just want you to be aware of that because, you know, I am a strong believer in that consent is not truly affirmative or positive when it's given from someone who was altered. Mm -hmm. All right. That's important to remember. Um, for tops, you know, don't try to change what's been, what has been agreed to inside of negotiation, what has been discussed prior to the scene occurring. Um, if you identify as a bottom, don't let nobody just do just anything to you because you are in a state of being altered, all right? Mm -hmm. Always remember that. So, moving on, we're going to move on to a section on safety. Um, before I move on, I just want to take a second and pause, make sure everybody's good, mm -hmm. not going too crazy, everybody's good, have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and remember, everybody, if you're in, um, if you're live, feel free to drop questions in chat. Mm -hmm. Sarah and I will be checking. Mm -hmm. We'll be making sure that um, we get all your questions answered. Um, so, yeah. yeah. All yeah. right. So jumping back in. Um, I have my phone in front of me. Um, I have pretty severe ADD. We'll just get off subject real hard so this helps keep me on track. So safety. One of the first things I want you to be mindful of in terms of, you know, safety in the realm of BDSM is that nothing that we do inside of kink, inside of BDSM is without risk. Everything carries with it some sort of risk. I don't care how simple it may seem or or just how not, you know, dangerous it may seem, everything within the realm of BDSM carries risk with it. Oh, excuse me. So one of the first things I want you to do is a trauma check. I want you to inquire about trauma. I want you to inquire about um, any trauma that somebody might have around impact. Um, again, some folks uh, receive physical abuse from different individuals in their life. Um, so it's good to, you know, check on trauma and to inquire, inquire whether or not, you know, impact play is something that is, you know, even on the table. Um, I want you to make sure that you have a good familiarity uh, with human anatomy. And for this part, here's my sub, Sosin. Sosin, can you say hi to the wonderful people on the open app? Hello. Fantastic. Hello. So human anatomy is definitely, um, human anatomy is definitely one of the most important aspects um, of impact play to, familiar, uh, to familiarize yourself with. Why? It helps you keep people's best interests at heart. It allows you to know the parts of the body, the body that are worthy of uh, more protection or staying away from and so on and so forth. 
So one of the first things you're going to need to know and understand is the location of major muscle groups in the body. Okay. Uh, so let's start with a start with a few. Let me bring my camera back a little bit. All right. I think that works. So um, yeah, that's good. Impact play happens, and, and in your impact play and how you do impact play will change based on what it is that you're using, the material that it's comprised of, its width, its length, its weight, and many other factors. But these are common areas where uh, one can be subject where you can exert impact play on a consistent person. All right? So up top, we have the trapezius. All right? Kind of a... V-shaped muscle that comes down to the center of your back. All right. We have the rhomboids, which are on either side of the back and right underneath the trapezes. The erector spinae, which goes on either side of your spine as well. It's a major muscle. All right. Again, where the muscles are located <coughs> and what they are, you know, I mean, it being a muscle doesn't automatically, you know, make it safe to, to hit or strike. Again, the location of things are subject to scrutiny and that we must be mindful of how we strike those things, how much force we give those things in the realm of pacing. Mm -hmm. And pacing is a subject that we'll get to in a little while. Okay? So the erectus spinae, okay? The gluteus minimus and maximus, or the ass, as it's called. <laughs> <laughs> the bootay. The pectoral muscles of the top and the bottom. We want to typically stay to the top of the pectoral. I like to stay up top on the pectoral because the nearer I get to the heart, the uh, bigger the risk I have of causing arrhythmia or palpitations based on the type of impact play that I'm doing there. Mm -hmm. So I stay close. I stay a little bit above that, below the clavicle. Uh, why don't we do strikes? A lot of the people that I played with enjoy being punched in the chest. All right. We also have the deltoids. Uh, we will concentrate mostly on the side deltoids. They're good for good light punch. The quadriceps on the front of the thigh. All right. Mm -hmm. Not on the side. We want to make sure that we're staying to the front of the thigh. Quadriceps. All right. There's a little something called a, uh, if I'm not mistaken, a T-band. Uh, Mm -hmm. If you strike it, uh, if you strike that nerve, it will cause somebody to not be able to walk very well and can result um, mm -hmm. in permanent damage as well. So those are some common areas um, that um, people strike for impact play. Now, referring to my little notes here, um, we have to talk about this to avoid. So uh, typically above the neck, we're doing light slaps. You can do harder slaps. But it's important with, with slapping that you stay away from the end of the jawline such that you don't cause anyone to get knocked out. Knock, um, knocking someone out is caused by the head and neck pivoting and the brain moving around inside of the skull. Mm -hmm. And it's shutting down the rest of the body. If you mm -hmm. slap somebody on the, in the right way or on the button, as we refer it to, it will cause that person to go to sleep. So anatomy of the face and where you hit a person like really matters. But that's pretty much what all you'll be doing um, above the neck until you get into other acts like edge play where, you know, people bring out the needles and staples and so on and so forth. Um, I want you to avoid striking areas that are near joints, all right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to mess anybody's joints up. Don't strike anybody's joints. Joints are not for an impact play in any shape, way, or form. Okay, I want you to stay away from underneath the armpits. I want you to stay away from the spine. I want you to stay away from the cossacks or the tailbone, okay? I really want you to stay away from the kidneys. Really want you to stay away from the kidneys. Joints, again, down on the legs, anything below the feet, just stay away from it. And that's going to be your light human anatomy lesson for things to avoid and safe places to hit. Yeah. All right. All right. That works. Okay. So you touched on safety. Let's move into uh, negotiation. Impact play is definitely, uh, I would say, one of the potentially 
um, exhausting uh, types of play, um, both for everyone involved for everyone involved because of, you know, again, those chemicals and hormones that are being altered within our bodies and just the, the level of exertion that it takes when we involve ourselves in impact play, you know, for bottoms, you're under duress, you know, saying your body is releasing cortisol, you know what I'm saying? It's a type of, you're under a type of stress. And after which, you know, you can have, you know, body temperature drops, you know, uh, and a myriad of, of other ailments if you're not careful about how you go into your scenes with impact play. So I just want y'all to make fire that everyone has eaten, that they're hydrated, and that they've eaten in the last three hours, okay? I'm definitely good for being one of those people who, you know, somebody's like, did you eat today? And yeah, I ate today, and it's like 10 hours ago that I ate, but I'm like, fine. But also, I could like yeah. fall out at any second. Mm -hmm. It's not important. Anyway, mm -hmm. so... No. Um, the next thing I want you to do, and I want you to, I want you to keep, and I want you to keep this in mind during the state of negotiation. Um, if you are new to BDSM, negotiation is a stage at which we sit down and we talk about the acts that we're that we're going to do inside the main part of you know a scene, which is the scene itself. All right, so. You know, the negotiation the negotiation part of BDSM is where you advocate for yourself, where you establish boundaries, where you state your needs, your wants, and your desires, you know. It's where you establish your different systems for safety, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so inside of negotiation, I want you to make sure people have eaten and they are hydrated. I also want you to inquire about people's range of motion and whether or not they have any old or new injuries, okay? You don't want to aggravate <laughs> any old injuries or create any new ones or, you know, position somebody or move somebody in a manner that is uncomfortable for them or unsafe, okay? Now, this one is, uh, <laughs> this one is very important to me. It does not get teached as, as often as I would like it to, but I need you to really remember that when you are doing scenes that involve gags, I need you to get it inside of your head to establish nonverbal protocol, okay? How can somebody communicate with you if you have a gag in, if you have a ball gag in, and something's wrong, or, you know, rope needs to come off, or something's too tight, or something was too hard, or, you know, so I need you to be able to establish nonverbal protocol for your scenes, especially where gags are involved, but not but nonverbal protocol is just good to have in your back pocket, you know. Anyway, I have been at many a BDSM party, many a BDSM event, many a BDSM uh, uh, convention, and and it never fails. I find myself in an environment where I can't hear the person that I'm playing with. I can't hear them at all. They could be screaming and I can't hear them. That is another way where nonverbal protocol comes in. This is for mm -hmm. safety. This is for keeping people's best interests at heart. So mm -hmm. me and myself, for instance, we utilize the color system in tandem with nonverbal communication. So when they are gagged, if I'll ask them, hey, what color are you or how are you doing right now? And if they stomp their right foot, it means green. If they stomp their left foot, it means yellow. And if they shake their head, then that means red. And then I need to mm -hmm. change something. And that's how we look out for one another. Okay? Mm -hmm. The next thing I need you to do inside of negotiation is get into co-creation. And that is creating with the individuals that you find yourself playing with, all right? Bottoms, submissives, receivers, I don't want you letting a dom or a top dictate to you what will occur inside of a scene, okay? And a sense of speaking, you have more control in the situation than they do because you get to dictate exactly what goes down in accordance with what you are comfortable with, okay? So... Co-creation dictates that we sit down and we make our scenes together. That one person isn't talking at one person, that people are actually sitting down and working together to make an experience for one another. Okay? So, before I move on to the next part, there's a couple of things that I also want you to remember. I want you to I want you to get this into your brain. I want you to I want you to really 
I want you to really open up to me right now. Okay. And when I say this, it's not the implement, but how you wield it. Okay. It's not the implement, but how you wield it. One more time. It's not the implement, but how you wield it. All right. This is a cane. Canes are one of the most disliked implements in the world of BDSM. I am sure that there are a few individuals <laughs> present with us tonight that can attest to how much they despise canes. All right. But I said it's the I said it's it's not the implement, it's how you wield it. Just because this is a cane doesn't mean that I need to strike somebody as hard as I can with it in order to use it like it's, you know, usually they are used. I don't have to hit anybody hard with any of these things mm -hmm. at all. I don't have to hit anybody softly <laughs> with any of these things, you know. Mm -hmm. And I say both sides of those because I always want you to remember to possess an air of malleability in your play. As you move through the world of BDSM, as you come across different individuals, you will find that people have different experiences, experience levels, all right? Mm -hmm. And it's important to be able to meet people where they're at, mm -hmm. all right? I do BDSM professionally. I cannot hold everyone to that same standard. I need to meet people where they are. Oh, you're just not getting into things. Okay, mm -hmm. that encompasses figuring out ways thinking up ways, brainstorming ways that you can be more accommodating to the individuals that you play with, okay? Mm -hmm. And being accommodating goes outside of the sensations that we give to one another. It also means learning to tie bigger individuals. That means learning the ways in which that you can, that you can play, with, play effectively with, with individuals who are part of the disabled community. That means if somebody has a chronic illness, that you, you figure out how you can keep that person's best interest at heart while you play with it, all right? I want you to always be malleable, both in your toys and in, in, in your practice of BDSM as well, okay? I want you to remember, <clears throat> I want you to remember that it just, it just does not have to hurt. BDSM does not have to hurt. At no time does BDSM have to hurt. We said, we said bondage, we said discipline, we said domination, we said submission, we said sadism, and we said masochism. And there's something in there for everybody. But also, as long as you are observing, as long as you're observing uh, consent as a multifaceted concept, as long as you are trauma-informed and mental health-informed and you're being honest and transparent and compassionate and understanding, you can make BDSM what you want it to be. Mm -hmm. the end of the day. I'm telling you that. You can make it what you mm -hmm. want it to be in a way that works for you the best. You do not have to adhere to any standards. This is not a monolith. You can do what you want, and I want you to. All right? How... <laughs> We're all just know, like, like all the like, snacks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> just like inclusive trauma and for mental health and for like, oh my god, could it get like the <laughs> <a> gold standard? <laughs> so um oh uh, oh yes. Um uh, how you hit how you hit someone inside of impact play, how you hit someone and where is subject to the implement itself. All right. This again goes back into malleability. All right. I do not swing or use each of these implements in the same way. How I play with them changes based on the person that I'm playing with, the mood that we've decided for the scene itself and the implement itself. All right. And we'll get a little bit we'll get a little bit more into that. But I want you to be thinking about the actual implements that you play with. All right. I'm talking about surface area, the material that it's made of, its length, its width, its height, and its mode of delivery, you know, can change how something feels. That's something that's between, you know, me swinging something overhand versus me swinging something from the side versus me swinging something over, underhand or me popping something at somebody. Each one of those changes the sensation that we give to other individuals. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Which brings me to Thud and Sting. All right. Thud and Sting. Impact Play brings with it two main kinds of sensation, Thud and Sting. All right. Now to break Thud and Sting down for you in a way that's a little bit more understandable. It's the difference between a punch and a slap. Mm. Even if you want to right now, you can take a second to see what that punch feels like and see what a slap feels like. Those are two very different sensations. Okay? Negotiation is important to determine your likes, to determine what will occur inside of the scene, to determine the sensations that will be given or received inside of the scene. Okay? Which is why specificity is one of the most important things for BDSM and inside of negotiation. Specificity is important. Why? Me and you could sit down and say, hey, Blackson, what's up? I want I want some impact play. I could say, cool. And if we left it with that, who knows what mm-hmm. I might say to you or, you know what I'm saying, the slide they hit you with. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. neither one of us has bothered to be specific in what it is exactly that we want to do. All right? Specificity helps you advocate for yourself. Specificity allows you to look out for yourself. All right? Specificity is an aspect of consent that is very important because, as we all know, per Planned Parenthood, is that consent always comes with fries and that it's freely given, it's reversible, it's informed, it's enthusiastic, and it's specific. Specificity inside of your negotiation. All right? That's how we determine what will occur inside of the scene. Okay? Now, more people are going to like that. More people are going to like that. That's just, you know, more people are going to like that. That's just how it goes. Um, But another thing that I also want you to remember in terms of impact play and moving closer to specificity uh, and moving closer to specificity is remembering that Thud and Sting also have different qualities and characteristics as well. And you're like, well, oh my God, what? It's just, it's just stud and sting. What the hell? <laughs> stud and sting can have different traits and characteristics. All right. So, me taking an open hand and slapping somebody—that's sting. Me taking this dragon tail. Let me see if I can. And popping it—that's a very different kind of sting. Yet, mm-hmm. both are still sting. The thud that you could receive from a boxing glove would be different from the thud that you would receive if you were to say, oh, you got hit by a car. <laughs> Those are two different kinds of thud. All right? So crossing again back into that specificity about how we're playing, what is occurring inside of this scene. I want sting, but I want sting like from an open hand, not from a single tail whip. I want thud in my sting. I want like deep penetrating thud like from a punch and not like one I would receive like from a bat, you know? So um, next point is, uh, you remember how I showed you all those, 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 those areas that we can hit mm-hmm. and interact with? Okay. That's going to change based on the type of implement that you have. All right. If I have so, if I had something like this is made out of leather. This is made out of like leather. It has however many tassels, 60, 60 tassels, I believe. Um, if they were all made out of like rabbit fur, <laughs> then they would feel very different. Like if I swung this as hard as I could, it would feel different. If I swung it as hard as I could and then had like rabbit fur, so like mm-hmm. keep that in mind. And that the different areas of the body, you won't be just limited to where I've just shown you. There are other places that you can hit, but but getting that fundamental knowledge is like so so important. Which leads me to telling you to spread your impact, mm-hmm. spread your impact, spread your impact. If you're hitting the left booty cheek, make sure you're hitting the right booty cheek. If you're hitting the right booty cheek, make sure you're hitting the left booty cheek. If you hit mm-hmm. both booty cheeks, take some of that impact up to the back if that person is consented to that. If that person that's consented to both of those, bring that impact back around to the thighs. All right? But it's important to spread that impact. 
so you don't tire out the bottom. So you don't mm-hmm. lessen the scene, the length of the scene that you're having with this person. All right? Ah, okay, we're making we're making decent time. Okay, all right. So, pacing. Pacing, pacing, pacing. This is the most important thing that I will tell you in this entire uh, workshop. Pacing, pacing, pacing. Uh, quick show of hands inside of the chat. How many people have gotten into a kinky situation with another individual, and when it started, they slapped you or hit you entirely too hard? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, we all know what that feels like. We all know what that feels like. Yeah. So this is why this is why this is why pacing is so important. Okay. Pacing refers to the escalation and de-escalation of sensations and energy in your scenes based on factors like feedback from checking in, sounds emitted from the bottom body language, and more. It describes how you strike someone in relation to rhythm, frequency, timing, and force with regard to the implement being used. Okay? That was a lot. I, that was a lot. <laughs> Basically, casing means taking your damn time. All right? Simple as that. Why? Because you've seen those videos, if you've seen those individuals who are getting, you know, the crap beat out of them consensually or getting their ass kicked, you know, on the scene and they're just having the time of their lives and you wonder like, wow, I could never do that. And that's because the person who is the top in that scene has spent time manipulating those bodily chemicals and hormones. Again, endorphins, adrenaline, oxytocin. When raised high enough, so does our tolerance like go up. So does our tolerance as well for different acts or for different things um, to occur. Um, But as we start our scenes in a state of homeostasis, it takes time to get to that point of being able to accept greater sensations. Okay? So pacing. Pacing is how you keep pacing is how you keep the energy inside of a scene pacing is how you help someone have a good time uh pacing is how you look out for the people that you play with you know when i go into a scene uh, position zero please 180 so when i start my scene with my bottom, this is how I usually start my scene, as to not shock the body from the fact that I'm about to do impact. If I had a paddle, I'll come in a little closer, let the nice people see you booty. (laughs) (laughs) I love you. (laughs) If if I'm playing with a paddle, I'm not going in swinging from the fences. I'm starting off soft. Then I can lean into what the frequency of my hits, the rhythm, the force in them, where they are, all of that is being adjusted on the fly. Okay? Pacing is just not about the acts that you perform to the people that you play with. It's about pacing yourself too. You know? And all your anxiousness and all of the, you know, all of what you want to, you know, do with the other people and all your anxiousness like don't forget to treat people like people when i'm playing with my sub i'm looking for witness and these are things i want you to be looking out for too i'm looking for witness i'm looking for discoloration i'm looking for if any blood has appeared because sometimes when i play with people based on the roughness of our play um they might bleed um i'm looking for if my sub is shielding if they're trying to shield certain parts of their body from me. I'm looking for if my sub is turning away from me when we're inside of play, where they're trying to get away from the source of that sensation. I am looking for if a strike 
that I gave my sub and their reaction, it was at a way higher volume than the previous one was. Okay. I am looking, I'm listening for their breathing patterns. I'm looking at their eyes and their eyelids. I'm looking for large reactions. And I'm checking the radius around me as I play. And these are things I want you to be aware of, in tune to. See, impact play is not as simple as just hitting someone with an object. It's a complex system that truly requires you to, 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 to hone your skills as a top, to hone your skills as a bottom, to learn more about yourself, to be willing to learn more about others, to be willing to create with other individuals. All right? It goes beyond just the swing of a floater. It goes way beyond that. I want you to look out for yourself. I want you to look out for the people that you play with. All right. Everything that I just said that I'm looking out for my bottom helps me to keep helps me to keep their best interest at heart at all times. Okay. If there's redness. I know that that's an area, and it's more red than other areas. I know that I've spent too much time on that part of my bottom. If there was any kind of discoloration, and we've thrown in something like choking, for instance, I know that maybe that they might be experiencing anoxia or hypoxia or you know some sort of lack of, of oxygen uh, if they are discolored in some way. If I see blood, I know that the risk of infection or, you know, other things that may my L, my bottom might like, could like possibly occur. I'm looking for shielding because that means that they have reached a limit to which they feel that they need to defend themselves from what is coming from me. And at that point, I need to stop and I need to be willing to check in. Mm -hmm. Okay? If their voice goes at a greater volume than it did in the previous strike, I know that I hit something wrong or I didn't hit it right or I hit them with the wrong part of the implement. Or, you know, they're just being a little shit. Like, who knows? <laughs> you know? Um, I'm listening for their breathing patterns, all right? A ragged breathing pattern might suggest that they're tired, you know? Mm -hmm. A calm breathing t uh, breathing pattern might suggest that they've reached subspace, you know? I'm looking for the eyes and eyelids. Dilated pupils also tell me that they might have reached subspace. You know, if they're glazed over, that that might mean that they're a little tired in the scene that they were doing together, you know. Um, I'm also checking my radius because, uh, again, I do a lot with flogging, and, you know, some people have definitely taken some floggers uh, to the face <laughs> a few times here and there. Um, then one of the last things I want to talk to you about is auto kink. Um, auto kink or self kink. Uh, Say you don't have somebody to spank you or someone to engage inside of impact play with. Uh, this is perfect. This is absolutely perfect. Okay. Why is this perfect? It's perfect because with auto kink or self kink or self spanking or self impact play, you get to figure out what exactly it is that you like. You get to figure out where it is that you like it. You get to figure out how you like it, and you get to just better advocate for yourself when you find yourself finally negotiating with the top of your dreams, all right, that you can say, hey, I like this, I like that, I like auto kink or auto impact play or self impact play as an absolutely valid form of BDSM, mm -hmm. and I want you to feel like it isn't, okay? Um, Another thing that I want to make sure that I say um, before I get out of here is that I realize that impact play is not the most accessible uh, type of play for BDSM. Uh, me and some friends are uh, brainstorming ways that we can help the disabled community better enjoy um, BDSM. And if you are part of that community uh, and you would like to contribute um, to that, like definitely uh, reach out for me. But it was important to me that I like acknowledge that. Um, as mm -hmm. well as part of several marginalized communities uh, myself. Um, other than that, I feel like that's it. Um, we've covered the things. How about you, Salty? You feel good? Mm -hmm. you feel good about the stuff? Mm -hmm. You feel good about the things? Did you have a good time? Yes. Thank you for having <laughs> that. Yeah, I appreciate you. Okay. <laughs> Not to break my white cloth. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Actually, <laughs> like, don't start the white claw. We got questions. Um, so, drink your white claw. Um, <laughs> the first one that uh, Goddess got Luna asked earlier when you were talking about, um, in, you know, kind of pacing the scene, uh, right about the time you were asking that, Goddess Luna posted, Do you get worn out when you play? I'm sorry, could you type that in the room? Because it's it, the audio is cutting in and out. Oh, sorry. Sure. Hang on one second. Um, are you, can you hear me okay now? Yeah, I can hear you okay now. Okay. Um, so Goddess Luna asked, do you get worn out when you play? <laughs> I do get, I get worn out when I play, um, and I have a couple <laughs> remedies for that. Now, um, little known fact about me, uh, unless people have, like, actually met me in person, I had a very serious, um, car accident in 2007, uh, when my arm was, like, crushed and broken oh. in, like, four different places. It's pretty gnarly. So that um, really changed the way um, that I do media. So, do I get tired? Yes. I overcame this by one, and this is the like extreme method, is um, training the supplementary muscles that I use when I um, when I play. Um, the main muscles that I end up using um, when I play, I mostly use a flogger and I mostly use a rope. Um, so mm -hmm. I did a lot of training on my uh, forearms. Mm -hmm. um, my forearms, my biceps, um, my deltoids, uh, my traps, and my rhomboids as well for the light moving of this light type motion. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that you can do is that I also have found effective, and if you've watched any of my like, flogging work, you might catch this sometime, is that while I'm flogging, um, I might change like hand positions. Um, for what I'm doing in order to preserve, like, the stamina of certain mm -hmm. muscle groups. So, uh, let me just move this to the side for a second. So, I could start, I can start here, and then my forearm gets tired, and now it's between my fingers now. And then mm -hmm. if something that, that gets too tired, I can switch to a, what I call a joystick grip. Mm -hmm. If that gets too tired, I can switch to what I call a bicycle grip. If that gets too tired, I can loop around the end of it, and I can just, like, swing that as well. Mm -hmm. So it's about, like, kind of, like, figuring things out and finding out, like, what works for you, like, mm -hmm. at the end of the day. But I definitely do get tired of my scene sometimes. Um, I wanted to throw in one thing. Um, one of the things that I tend to do when I, because I do fatigue really easily because of some chronic pain issues, um, I've actually learned how to like swap out to other parts of my body. Um, so I'll go from like using a flogger to like using my knee to kind of like hit somebody's butt um, because that gives my shoulder a break, it gives my arm a break, and then I can come back to that once I've had a, a minute to rest it. But yeah, nobody just does this shit for like an hour and a half at a time and, and not get worn out. That just doesn't, yeah. that's not real life. <laughs> yeah, and switch your implement, switch your implement. I have okay. at least, yeah. I have at least very so, know, six or seven different floggers and all of them serve different purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sometimes this is one of my, uh, this is a flogger that I got um, a few years ago that is smaller than any other flogger I have, but it's one of the most, like, prized and just effective, like, flogger, along with its um, sibling that I have owned in all of the floggers that I've ever had. And this, like, allows me to, you know, this allows me to, log, to flog for, you know, longer periods of time, which is to say, you know, buy your implements around your capabilities. Lord knows I've been in Dutch and I've seen people with with an implement that was bigger than they was, <laughs> or, you know, struggling mm -hmm. to like try to try to swing it or to try to use it. It's like, you gotta, you gotta like, you know, think of it as like dressing yourself, like in a sense of speaking. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, think about think about what will be like best tailored like to you. You know, mm -hmm. always be willing to switch implements in the middle of a scene if that is even to a completely different implement. You know, mm -hmm. From fall hand, You know what I'm saying? And now you know we get some of this. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. um yeah um we had some questions about ideas for longer lasting marks somebody said that them they and their boy enjoy them but their boy heals very quickly first thing um, you need to understand that, that bites and, and somebody seconded and, that and bruises uh a lot of genetics really play into that 
um, in a sense of speaking, and you know your body type, the type of body you have, uh, but like pretty much genetics. Um, first thing for anybody else listening in the room that identifies as a submissive or uh, bottom, um, I just don't want you to feel like marks or bruises are an indication of the validity of your love of BDSM. It is no indicator like whatsoever whether or not you have bruises or you don't have bruises. That does not that that does not bar you or that does not, you know, keep you from enjoying BDSM or being able to say that this is something that you enjoy. These aren't mm -hmm. trophies. All right. So that's the thing. I don't want you to go like uh, hunting for it because you feel like it's some sort of, you know, mark of the fact that you do this. All right. Mm -hmm. Second thing, um Marks that you receive depends on the type of play um, that, that you do and playing with individuals that know how to bruise and leave marks uh, on people. My, um, my submissive is biracial. Um, they are very, very light-skinned. Uh, and I know, that if I, <laughs> I know that if I hit them in a certain way, that they will absolutely bruise for, mm -hmm. you know, days on end, whereas... You know, I've played with people who just don't bruise, and we had a particularly, like, hard scene. You know, mm -hmm. it's not it's not going to be the thing for everybody. You know, there are so many other factors that play into it. You know, your own experience level, um, how far close to the edge you play in terms of BDSM, whether or not, you know, you play hard or you play somewhere in the middle or you play, you know, very lightly in terms of your BDSM. The implements that you are using are, are going to play a factor. You know what I'm saying? This implement is uh, uh, falls within the realm of steam, and it like kind of like slaps like a person, you know. But I don't I don't see that leaving a whole whole lot of marks unless I really put my back into it. Mm -hmm. This is pretty much the equivalent of a fucking leather bat, <laughs> and uh, if I hit somebody in the right way with this, it'll definitely like leave a mark. You also have to remember that other parts of leaving like bruises and marks, um, the surface area of the toy um, that you're playing with, the material um, that it's made of, how far it's penetrated in the skin. Because a bruise or a mark is just blood pooling underneath your skin. That's basically what it is. It's like, mm -hmm. okay. uh, and how that happens just depends on like so many different factors. But I just don't want you to go like searching for it or go looking for something. Like it's this like holy grail or this like thing that really like validates your existence within a mm -hmm. world. All right. Yeah. Uh Lizzie Doll asked, what are the different flogger types used for? Is there is there a way to encapsulate that? So different floggers um that I use um because I do videos professionally, I am a pro dom as well. Uh, I have to meet. I have to really meet people um, where they are. I did not bring all my floggers down here, um, <laughs> but I have. So this flogger, um, I'm able to convey thud, both thud mm -hmm. and sting with a flogger, um, based on my own studies and things that I've like taught myself within the realm of flogging. Um, but some floggers are more for thud. Some floggers um, and are more in the realm of sting. Uh, I have a rubber flogger that I use for people that I play that I use for people that I play with who identify as vegan. Um, I I have th different materials of different floggers also feel different. This one is like bull hide. I have one that's deer skin. I have one that's mm -hmm. uh, I have one that's bison hide. I have one that's like and all of these different um, all of these different floggers like feel different. They mm -hmm. all cut differently and also have different widths and lengths in terms of the falls mm -hmm. or the tassels that are on them as well, mm -hmm. which when you start getting into potential energy and inertia and blah, 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 physics. Um, but yes, <laughs> all of them, all of them are feel different. Um, and I have all of them for different reasons. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I would say that if you are in a place where you have a shop locally that uh, sells floggers, um, most sex positive shops that do that will let you, you know, pick it up and, and swing it a little bit and see what it feels like. Um, and I, Blackson, I loved the fact that you talked about hitting yourself essentially. Um, because I think that, you know, as, as somebody who was a novice top at one point, being able to like hit myself, feel what different kinds of throws felt like, um, gave me a better idea of how to use them on another person. <sighs> Definitely. 
Um, I, you know, I take a flogger to my back, like in the middle of the store, so I can see what it feels like on the snap. You know, mm-hmm. like hitting somebody with it in terms of the thud, or to take it, you know, across my arm, just to like get a feel for what it feels like. Um, mm-hmm. Well, and yeah, floggers are. I have a flogging class that is like it's a lot, but um, mm-hmm. it's one of my favorite classes to teach. It's just so much goes into choosing a flogger. Very briefly, I can tell you. Mm-hmm. If you go go get a flogger, get it from mm-hmm. a respected dealer. I deal mm-hmm. almost solely with agreeable agony. Um, mm-hmm. Try to get a flogger that when you sit down a little bit, that when you hold it up, like it's in my hand, like here at the end of it, when you hold it up, it's somewhere mm-hmm. near your armpit, and that is um, for the reason of flow. Uh, I've been to too many parties where somebody's just swinging a flogger and they're just. Mm-hmm. In fact, you know what? We got a we got a couple minutes. So sick because this is zero. Yay, we get to watch. Sorry. <laughs> so for the purpose of flow, if my flog is too short or it's too long, I won't be able to do what I'm about to show you. Uh, this should be uh move about right there. Right? If your frog is too short or too long, you can't do that at all. Even mm-hmm. if you get into other kinds of flogging, when I'm holding the person mm-hmm. that I'm flogging, and so on and so forth, like you just don't get that same flow. So mm-hmm. that's why I recommend getting something with the link that's uh, kind of near your armpit. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's a great piece of advice. And we also, I just found out that Agreeable Agony is mm-hmm. like, their headquarters is like 20 minutes from our hashtag open headquarters. Um, I just found we had out, one more exciting. a little <laughs> further up, and then we um, – okay, so we got that. just want to make sure that we get everybody's questions. Um, Goddess Luna asks, what the experience with a cat of nine tails, what is that like? <laughs> <Hey. laughs> uh, we okay, so. that's fun. So for those who don't know, cat of nines are – it's like a flogger, but it only has nine tails. Right. So this um, is my cat of nines. Um, it was given to me by my anchor partner. Um, and it is very heavy. Um, it is. Um, oh, that one is a Chicago toy company. Uh, uh, the, the company that makes that Chicago tool works. They. OK, I, yep. I forget. It's. Uh, yeah, that's a Chicago okay. one. Um, bull hide, special, um, special handle. Um, it's very heavy. It took me a long time to, uh, get used to swinging cat of nines. The difference between it and a flogger is that there are like so many tassels. So what happens is, is that, you know, as a result of, um, like centripetal force, uh, your tassels will stay together. As long as you swing mm-hmm. the flogger in a way, um, that is the right way. Your tassels will mm-hmm. stay um, somewhat together. With this, they were on all going all over the place. And that's because I'm weighted on the end of my flogger here. And I'm mm-hmm. also weighted on this end as well, which mm-hmm. messed with the weight uh, distribution. And um actually hit you. <laughs> Go past <the> <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to accidentally hit. You want to hit intentionally. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Uh, so, like, so just learning to, like, keep it together, that's all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there you go. We'll, we'll cut it off. I just want to say thank you so much to Blacks, and um, I think you were truly, um, well, the reason <laughs> Sarah said, like, we've been so excited to have you, and um, thank, you, and thank, you so thank you, Blacks. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. This we has been incredible. We enjoy being here. 